Right now at 6, tests show there is contaminated water in Edgerton. It prompts a dispute over who should pay for a fix. And new details into an alleged sexual assault at Madison East High School as the district is offering an apology. Plus, the city of Madison now has a new mayor. We'll go to the swearing-in ceremony. That's straight ahead. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 6. And thanks for joining us. We will have those stories in just a moment. But first, some breaking news from our Channel 3000 Alert Center. Investigators say the death of a Cottage Grove man who was found in a field in Marshall over the winter has been ruled accidental due to long exposure to the weather and intoxication. The body of 47-year-old Kurt Meyer was found January 17th. This was near the Evergreen Village Mobile Home Park. Investigators say unless they get any new information, the case is now considered closed. Six homes in Edgerton tested in a recent survey have contaminated water and the city says it could be the homeowner's responsibility to fix the problem. Live now from our Rock County Bureau at the Janesville Gazette, Adam Duxter spoke with some residents there today. Adam? Well, Eric, what would you do if you found out that your home's water supply was contaminated with lead? It's the question that nearly a half dozen Edgerton families have to answer, and neighbors are saying it should be the city's responsibility for taking care of the issue. Into the filter, then it gets filtered, comes right up here, and it goes into the faucet and comes out filtered. This is what day to day is like for David Evanchenko and his wife Rana since they moved into their Edgerton home. Since day one, there were filters uh, installed in the kitchen sinks and the kitchen faucets. There were odors in the water. Even with the filter, David and Rana had their concerns and made the switch to bottled water. They know in their old home, there's always a chance to have lead in the water. And during a recent round of testing by the DNR, the city of Edgerton confirmed six houses in the area did. Certainly we are concerned about the implications for all aspects of what that means for our citizens. We're concerned about our utility. City Administrator Ramona Flanagan says while the city's water is just fine, they're seeing an issue coming from people's own pipes. All of this creating more worries for David and Rana. Did they test our house? Um, why didn't our house get tested if it wasn't? And then it probably should be tested. Flanagan says the city's priority is making people aware of the issue. But the city has no immediate plans to fix the pipes, which all lie on private property. She says the best thing these homes could do is buy a filter or take on the costs of replacing the pipes. You can't just expect the average person to, you know, invest thousands and thousands of dollars to fix something that the city is really responsible for. And while David and Rana aren't sure if their home has issues with lead in the water, they do say this has taken away their peace of mind. It's not just Flint, Michigan. It's also Edgerton, Wisconsin. An Edgerton City Administrator, Ramona Flanagan, says this testing could have a margin of error, but she does say this is more of a common thing than you might think, and that no matter where you live, if your home was built before the 1980s, she says it'd be worth it to pick up a testing kit and test for lead in your water. Adam Ducks are reporting in our Rock County Bureau tonight. Adam, thank you. Police in Sun Prairie are still searching for three men who they believe shot someone last night near the Prairie Athletic Club. Officers say three masked men were seen leaving the scene shortly after the shooting about 915 PM. The 45 year old victim is still in the hospital with a gunshot wound to the stomach area said now to be in stable condition. Police say they believe the shooting was a targeted incident and are continuing to investigate. Lawmakers are hopeful that a new proposal will establish a clear protocol and clear up years of confusion over untested sexual assault kits in Wisconsin. Attorney General Josh Call and a group of bipartisan lawmakers held a news conference today announcing a new bill. It would establish timelines that health professionals and police would use to send the rape kits for testing. Crime labs would be required to store the evidence kits for up to 10 years or until the victim decides to report the assault to police. Tens of thousands of rape evidence kits have gone untested nationwide. A nice improvement today as temperatures got back into the 60s, but things will cool down a bit tomorrow as a chance for some severe weather moves in. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti now with our first alert forecast. Gary.
Actually, temperatures will stay the same for tomorrow. They'll cool down on Thursday, and that will actually limit the threat for severe weather on Thursday. So that is some good news there. We've taken an alert day out of the forecast for Thursday, but visible cloud track for today shows that we had sunshine. Now it's giving way to clouds coming in from the west, but still not much in the way of shower and thunderstorm activity out to the west of us. We'll see that develop later on tonight, and that should move in for tomorrow. Uh, low temperatures this morning, very mild. Started out at 46 here in Madison. High temperatures today were as warm as 72 in Mineral Point, 69 degrees in Boscobel, 72 in Janesville, but notice near Lake Michigan temperatures were in the mid to upper 50s. Here in Madison, we topped out at 65. Right now, 61 in town. Many locations seeing temperatures in the 60s away from Lake Michigan. By tomorrow morning, temperatures will be in the mid to upper 40s. Look for a high temperature of 63 for tomorrow, about the same as today. We'll see some shower and thunderstorm chances. That's your news for now. First alert forecast. Gary, thank you. The East High School principal is apologizing for statements made by the Madison School District's head of security about an alleged sexual assault inside the school last week. We're also learning more about what happened in that incident. Our Amanda Quintana joins us now with more on what we know tonight. Amanda? Yes, well, tonight we're learning through a search warrant to get DNA from one of the two 15-year-old boys arrested that the victim claims one of them took her backpack and ran to get her into a bathroom. Police say then the second boy entered and they both sexually assaulted her. Surveillance video confirms both boys were in that bathroom at East High School. Yesterday, we asked safety and security coordinator Joe Ballas about security after school. The back backlash came from this response. So obviously, you know, when parents see, you know, that this allegedly happened on school grounds, that mm -hmm. worries them because, you mm -hmm. know, if they're being told there's security there, right? How, how does something like this happen? What, what do you say to well, parents? Well, our, our buildings are full of kids and kids will be kids. And as terrible and tragic as that incident um, sounds, I would just ask that people just be patient and they're juveniles and uh, we have, our schools are very safe, you know, but there are incidents that are gonna happen from time to time. This statement from the Madison School District Safety and Security Coordinator was quick to gain backlash. Many parents upset by the kids will be kids comment. A story about security measures to prevent more violence has some feeling the district is minimizing the severity of last week's alleged sexual assault. East High Principal Mike Hernandez apologizing for Balez's statement in a letter saying part of trauma-sensitive schools is looking at the experiences students and staff have in our building that are traumatic or could trigger trauma responses. Balez has also released a statement calling it an extremely poor word choice. He said he was speaking about students in the building in general, admitting still I should not have made those comments in a story on this topic. It is never okay to rationalize, minimize, or excuse sexual assault, and there is no excuse for my words. It really just perpetuated this rape culture that allowed for somebody to be raped in, you know, on school grounds after school. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we work every day to um, counteract. The Rape Crisis Center saying those words were deeply troubling, sticking to their mission that sexual assault is preventable. When you make a statement like that, there is an assumption that boys cannot help but be sexually aggressive to, to girls, and that is not the case. Principal Hernandez and the district say they will be partnering with the Rape Crisis Center to make sure students and staff are learning about rape culture, sexual assault, and consent, something the Rape Crisis Center says can be taught. They are constantly repeating that message when they go to schools and do these presentations. Amanda Quintana reporting that. Amanda, thank you very much. Madison now officially has a new mayor, Satya Rhodes Conway, sworn in this afternoon at the City County Building. Immediately after that ceremony, she held a joint press conference with Dane County Executive Joe Parisi announcing a resolution over a disputed road project. Our Keeley Arthur will take a look at what it means for those along that route and those who use Buckeye Road. That's tonight. Join us for News 3 Now at 10. President Donald Trump plans to visit Wisconsin at the end of the month. He'll hold a rally April 27th in Green Bay. It will be at the Rush Center there at 7 p.m. People can register for up to two tickets available on a first come, first serve basis. This Thursday is a day many have been looking forward to. The terrace chairs will be back out at the Union Terrace, 4 p.m. Thursday afternoon, officially kicking off the 2019 terrace season in what has become a community event. If you'd like to help them out, people can line up at the North Park Street entrance starting at 3 p.m. Still ahead at 6, we'll get our forecast for Thursday. We'll see if the weather will cooperate for that event. But first, loyalty to your community, no matter the size, the story from the small town of Brigham when we come back.
If you're not sure where exactly the town of Brigham is, you're not alone. But this township that surrounds the village of Barneveld is celebrating nearly a century of service with the retirement of its town clerk today. We sent our resident Iowa County native Leah Linshide back to her home area to share the story. Yeah. Even on her last few days in office. I always turn my calendar so the day is right. Thanks, John. Audrey Rui refuses yep. candy for the road. to buck tradition. The candy bowl is definitely a tradition. I'll take one for a snack. <laughs> Habit has a whole new meaning. That's my last day. After 36 years as the Brigham town clerk. So this is the town of Brigham. We are actually a township and a half. In a town nobody seems to know. First thing they ask is, well, where's that at? Its clerk can tell you everything about it. Everybody knows, you know, they got a question about, even if it's not town related, they call Audrey. And this is the Dane County line. She has the answers. Road, Shirk Road. She's always the person you can go to get to get what you need. When Audrey retires this week, she'll take with her that institutional knowledge, not just of her township, but of the townspeople inside it. Yes, yes, everybody knows Audrey. You know, she cares about everybody in the township. That much is clear. The residents are just so wonderful. Um, that's what I'll miss the most, the people. Nearly four decades of service is certainly to be admired, but what makes Audrey's story special is that of another Brigham resident she didn't know. My predecessor had 55 years. Norman Dusler served for more than half a century in Audrey's position before she took office. The town of Brigham was born in 1890. In the first 30 years, we had 10 clerks, and since then, we've had two. In 91 years, we've had two clerks. Norman got sick in his final months as clerk and died before Audrey could ever meet him. But in the years following, she found advice in his family. Yes, I have become friends with his daughter. I was daddy's girl. Elsie Jane Murphy has fond memories of her father. When he spoke, people listened because what he had to say was right on. Though they never knew each other, it seems Audrey has followed in his footsteps in at least one way. He was described as a community leader, and Audrey is too. And he would have been so proud of her. Very, very proud. 91 years of service between two town clerks. That's quite a legacy for this little township. So there's a lot for the folks who, who take those positions and how loyal they are to the communities they serve. That habit been fun working with of you. popping in to visit and just chat. I need to make you cry. <laughs> I've been getting choked up. <laughs> I can lately. imagine. With their longtime friend, will be hard to break. I don't live far away, so I hope our paths cross. Um, yeah, I. Brigham will be fine without me. They will. <laughs> but I will miss it. In the town of Brigham, I'm Leah Linshide for News 3 Now. In her retirement, Audrey says she plans on spending a lot of time at Miller Park. She's a big baseball fan. She has actually been to 29 of the 30 big league ballparks so far, and she's planning on visiting the last one on her list out in Seattle, T-Mobile Park, sometime this summer. Still ahead tonight in sports, we'll hear from the National League MVP, Christian Yelich, after a record-setting performance last night against the Cardinals. But first, alert days in the forecast, and Gary will break down our chances for thunderstorms tomorrow when we come back.
Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti joining us now as we could hear a little thunder the next day or yeah, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll get some thunderstorms late tonight through the day tomorrow and into tomorrow evening. The big question is whether or not we'll see any severe weather. It's possible that we could see a couple of isolated severe thunderstorms or at least strong ones. Now, as we take a look at visible cloud track, last night we had showers. There wasn't much in the way of thunderstorm activity, but we had some clouds early this morning. Those moved on out. Then we had sunshine for much of the day. Now we're seeing more clouds coming in from the west, and this is actually warmer air aloft that is pushing in our direction. The really warm air is just to our south, but those clouds really aren't producing any precipitation yet. We'll watch to see uh, thunderstorms develop out there later tonight, and the Storm Prediction Center does have a marginal risk of severe thunderstorms into uh, much of southern Wisconsin for tomorrow. Slight risk farther to the south, uh, still across parts of eastern Iowa and northern Illinois. That's where the atmosphere will be more unstable. They'll probably see less rain there, but they could see some stronger thunderstorms. Rainfall amounts, according to the, our uh, latest computer model forecast, generally about a half inch to an inch over much of southern Wisconsin, but there could be some localized amounts in excess of an inch or two in a heavier thunderstorm. More general rains could lead to heavier rains up in northern Wisconsin. Now, as we take a look at the computer model forecast, basically what we expect is, that right, even though we're mild right now, winds are still out of the north. That's why temperatures are in the 60s here, but to the south where those winds are out of the south, they're in the mid-70s. This is actually a warm front, which with time will start working northward. These showers and thunderstorms storms develop just north of the warm front and notice during the day tomorrow this is at 4 p.m. notice the winds becoming more southeasterly as low pressure moves just north of La Crosse so depending on how far north that warm front gets we could see a big range in temperatures maybe 50s north of Madison to near 70 near the Illinois state line that's where the greatest threat for severe weather will be in the warmer air but the more uh, general rains will be farther to the north now with time notice a cold front comes through this is midnight tomorrow night the cold front already coming through at that point so temperatures will be mild but they'll start cooling off and on Friday, because of cloud cover and precipitation, will only be in the upper 40s to lower 50s. That's why we took the alert day out of the forecast for Thursday. It looks like the severe weather threat will be farther to the east in Indiana, where temperatures will be warmer. And then after that, eventually the showers will come to an end by Friday morning. So we still have an alert day in the forecast for tomorrow for an isolated strong to severe thunderstorm, gusty winds, hail, and heavy rain being the main threats. Time lapse from the uh, WISC sky cam shows that we had cloudy skies this morning, then some sunshine during the day, and then the clouds started to thicken up again as we headed through the afternoon hours. Now as we take a look at the live view from the WISC sky cam, skies are mostly cloudy here. The uh, uh, Platteville Queen Bee Radio sky cam showing mostly cloudy skies and the Edgewater sky cam in downtown Madison also showing mostly cloudy skies and uh, temperatures uh, right now are generally in the middle 60s. So our forecast for tonight calls for temperatures to drop to a low of 47. We'll see showers, maybe a thunderstorm toward morning. Then for tomorrow, showers and thunderstorms off and on through the day. High temperature topping out at 63. On future track, again, the shower and thunderstorm chances move in late tonight into the day tomorrow. Tomorrow evening, the thunderstorm chances end, but showers will continue into the day on Friday with high temperatures only in the upper 40s and lower 50s. Rainfall amounts half inch to an inch, some heavier amounts in a heavier thunderstorm. Seven to 10 day forecast, temperatures warm back up for the weekend. Just a slight chance for a thunderstorm on Easter Sunday and temperatures staying in the 60s for much of next week. Make your Badger football plans for seven years from now. Stories coming up in sports.
Make your plans. Badger football announced the date of its season opener in 2026. The Western Michigan Broncos will be at Camp Randall Stadium Saturday, September 5th, 2026. That's seven years from now. Everyone wants to know about quarterback Graham Mertz is an early enrollee and figures to push for the starting position this fall. Now we're early in spring practice, but quarterbacks coach John Budmeyer, also a former Wisconsin QB, says Mertz has stayed very grounded despite all of that outside attention. What he does a great job of is being in the moment, and I think that helps him not look too far ahead, not look at what the future holds, but truly just dive into it. And he's done that since day one here. He did a great job. There was a lot of um, different obstacles he worked through in the recruiting process to get here, and so he's very mature, and he's allowed himself the opportunity to have success because he's how, of how he's kept himself in the moment. That WIAA football realignment plan was unanimously approved by the Board of Control today and changes will begin in the 2020 football season. Janesville Craig and Parker will now move from the Big 8 to the Badger Conference in 2020 and a lot of other conference dominoes will fall too. You think Christian Yelich going to hit another homer tonight? Brewers are playing the Cardinals so the odds are pretty good because he hit three last night in five games against the Cardinals this season. Yelich is hitting 563 with seven homers and 15 RBI. First pitch tonight is at 640. Game two of the Bucks Pistons playoff series is tomorrow night at Fiserv Forum. They'll tip just after 7 o'clock. Game one wasn't much of a game as the Bucks took apart the Pistons 121-86. Blake Griffin probably out for the whole series with a knee injury. But despite all that, the Bucks look to remain focused. As a team, we're not going to try to treat it as um, a different game. You know, a lot of uh, people say, you know, when you go to the playoffs, they test this higher. The teams play way, way better. But you know, how much better can a team get in the playoff? I think uh, teams just get more focused. Um, they're locked in in their plays, they're locked in their defense, but, but we got we got goals that we want to get, and um, uh, these games are, you know, uh, in front of our goals. Aaron Rodgers used to be the highest paid player in NFL history, but at about 1.30 this morning, well, that's when the Seattle Seahawks signed quarterback Russell Wilson to a new four-year, $140 million contract. He gets a $65 million signing bonus. So four years, $140 million, that works out to be an average annual salary of $35 million a year, putting Russell Wilson on top of the highest paid NFL players list. Rodgers' new deal has him at $33.5 million a season. Atlanta's Matt Ryan, the only other NFL player to average $30 million a season. You know his name's not on that list? Tom Brady. He'll make $14 million this season. And the Northwoods League season just around the corner. The Mallards play in Madison, of course, but the Green Bay Bullfrogs are now the Green Bay Booyah. That's their new mascot, a chicken named Rocky. They used to be the Green Bay Bullfrogs. They're moving to a new stadium in Ashwaubenon and changing their name to Booyah, which is a rich chicken and beef stew that's served up at community events up north. Never a big bowl of Booyah? No. Oh, interesting. Ooh, I like the, what about the unis? Yeah, flannel. It's like a tablecloth for a jersey. It's weird when the mascot can be part of the dish. Yeah, that's usually after the game. Yeah, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right. Oh yeah. <laughs> Forecast, Gary. Uh, actually, pretty nice. Uh, Temperature-wise, we'll be in the 60s through tomorrow. Uh, nothing out there right now. Shower and thunderstorm chances will develop late tonight. Right now, we're at 61 in Madison, still close to 70 out west, 68 right now in Boscobel, and 68 in Janesville, but only 40s near Lake Michigan. Tomorrow, high of 63, showers and thunderstorms, an alert day for potential for a strong to severe thunderstorm and some heavy downpours. Thursday, cooler with showers, and then those will end on Friday. Should be a nice Easter weekend with maybe a thunderstorm chance on Easter Sunday afternoon, and then 60s for much of next week. That's a lot better than that booyah we had last right. weekend. That was no fun. All right, thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here at 10.